gospel reading comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 14. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth, you know him and have seen him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. May God's blessing be upon us. And may God protect us from the enemy that would try to steal this word from us. Amen. In this section of, of John's Gospel, we, we come to the, to the point where, where Jesus is preparing His disciples for His death. Um, um, these chapters in here are often referred to as John's farewell discourse to His disciples. His farewell speech to His disciples. He's, he's taking time to, to be with His disciples, to, to prepare them for that which will come. Um, and for that which we know is coming. We know this. We, we know how this story, as John is telling it, ends. We, we know it ends on a cross. And we, we know it ends in a grave. And we know it ends with the resurrection. But the disciples in here just don't know these things yet. And Jesus is, pre is preparing them. Readying them and also trying to steady them for the, for the time that will come. This, this passage of Scripture is um, often, and rightly so, often used during funeral services. It's a key passage for a funeral service. Um, it's one that um, we need to hear during that time, those words that Jesus spoke to His disciples. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. And one of the most troubling times in, in our lives is when we deal with death. And we ask the question, why? Why did this have to happen? Why now? Why did it take so long? Why did they have to suffer so much? Why, why, why? We ask those why questions. And in the midst of those why questions, we find our hearts not only being broken, but becoming troubled. And Jesus' words echo through the ages to us. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he says. Believe in God, believe also in me. And we hear these words and we know that in the midst of our brokenness, something better is being prepared for us. Something better has already been prepared for us. For us. Jesus says that. Again, I'm just going to read it. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And I and when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I go and prepare a place for you. A prepared place for you. Now those times when I travel up and down the interstate, um, I, I'm always impressed by the billboards that are trying to, to get me to do something um, that I don't want to do. But I'm also impressed by those billboards that are just directing me to do something that I actually do want to do. And that's to stop and take rest. Those billboards that are out there for, for um, hotel rooms and motel rooms, a place to stop. And all of those places are, are in a way saying, we have a place for you. A place for you at the right price, with the right amenities, and this is free Wi-Fi now is a big one. Uh, 
um, a swimming pool is a big one for, for us with children, and an indoor swimming pool is really important for us with children, especially during this time of year. So we're looking for those things that have been prepared specifically for us on our journey. And the billboards are all over the place. And, and now with the um, advance of technology, sometimes we can even go on our smartphones and put in things. And I'm looking for a specific place to stop with these things. That somewhere along the way, through, through marketing genius of people, they, they know exactly how to reach my particular family. Because a place has been prepared for me. A place to rest. A place to put my luggage. A place of safety. And a place that costs the right amount of money. People right now are working on this for all of us. So that when we're on the road, they'll know how to take care of us. Um, and certainly they'll know how to take our money along the journey. And we, when we think about that, that, these are people that don't know us, have never met us, but they all they want from us really is an exchange of, exchange of money for us, for preparing a place for us. How much more is Jesus Christ doing for us? If someone who just wants you to come and stay for the night is preparing a place for you in such a way, how much more is Jesus doing for you? If someone is doing this just for the moment, just for um, a few hours in the room, it's one of the things about staying in a hotel for one night that always upsets me. You can't check in till 4 o'clock and you have to check out by 11. I don't even get a full day in there. There's a racket going on here. It's really, it upsets me every time. How much more is Jesus doing for you? When he's preparing a place for you, not for a few hours, not just for a few moments, not just for a day of rest, but for all eternity. How much more? And Jesus promises us this in this passage of Scripture. Do not let your hearts be troubled because I have a place prepared for you. I have a place prepared for you. In my Father's house are many rooms and it's prepared for you. But this week, as I was meditating on this passage of Scripture, I started to think more about what was going on in the context of Jesus talking to His disciples as He was beginning to depart from them as, a, as the earthly Jesus, as the, the incarnation of the, the Jesus of the flesh. I started to think about it in those terms, but also in terms of, of, the, of the promise made of the place, of, and there's many rooms. That there's many rooms. And I started to think about um, as when we move from house to house. And our houses that we move to in this day and age, different from many of the houses that, that during Jesus' time, have many rooms. But I started to think about what room do I want prepared first? What room do I want taken care of first when I move into a house? And as an itinerant minister, I've had the opportunity to move at least a few times in my professional life. Interestingly enough, um, I have moved less from house to house as an ordained minister than I ever did um, as, as a child or a lay person. Um, the, the, longest, the, the, the two longest houses I've ever lived in were parsonages. Um, I, I think that's great to have more stability as a pastor than I did um, when it comes house to house than I did even as a child. But I know what it means to move from house to house. And I know that one of the first things I want set up in a house when I move to it is the kitchen. It's the kitchen. Now, I want to have a place to lay my head, but I don't need my bedroom um, completely put together. I don't need my, 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 my living room completely put together. I'd like to have a TV hooked up like the rest of you, but it doesn't have to be perfectly put together. But I do want my kitchen right. I do want that right because that's the place where I can congregate and eat and spend time with my family and do those things that, that bring my family together. And I know that two or three times a day, at least, I'm going to want to sit down and eat and have a place to do that. I know that's going to happen. I know that even when we moved here as a, as a as the pastoral family and we came here and you were doing work on the parsonage and we, we could not yet move into the parsonage. That when we came by the parsonage, when we would stop and talk and congregate, more often than not, we were doing that in the kitchen. Something that wasn't a stove in there, the refrigerator wasn't in there at that point. It was just seemed like a normal and natural place to congregate and to gather. And when we brought food in, there was probably more room in the living area to sit down and eat. We always seemed to do it in the kitchen to seem natural. Like the natural place to do that. 
So I started to think, well, if Jesus is going ahead of me to prepare a place for me, He's going to be preparing me that kind of place. A place where I can be together with the ones I love. Where I can be sustained and fulfilled, where I can be fed and nurtured and nourished. It's going to be a place a lot like a kitchen. In Jesus' time, that would be true as well. I mean, they would come to the stove, to, 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 the, to the place where the fire was. That's where they gathered. They gathered there for warmth, for cooking, for conversation. That's where they stayed. They didn't have as many rooms, but the place was a place of warmth and coming together. That Jesus is preparing us this kind of place that's not just for a moment, that's not just for a few hours, but for all eternity. And then I had to think about it a little bit more deeply when I was thinking about Jesus preparing that place for us in the context of Him telling His disciples goodbye. And one of the things we know when Jesus told His disciples goodbye, one of the things He did that was so important was to sit down and have a meal with them. It was the Passover meal. John's really clear about it being the Passover meal. He talks about it not once but twice, but three times. I remember, if I'm correct, you can, you can email me and tell me I'm wrong. That's okay. I get those from you sometimes. But I think it was three times he talks about the Passover meal. And we know that when Jesus sat down with his disciples at the Passover meal, he, he transformed that meal. Then when the meal was over, he had communion. Or he, he turned into what we now call communion by saying, lifting up the bread and the wine and saying, this is the cup. It's a new cup, a new covenant. It's my blood poured out for you. When you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And he lifted up the bread. And he said, this is my bread. This is the bread. This is my body. When you break this, when the bread is broken, you'll do it in remembrance of me. And you'll receive this in remembrance of me. That, but we know that Jesus does that as he's dealing with and talking to his disciples. And it's a transformative kind of meal. But then I look more closely at what's going on in John. And it hit me. And I was reminded again. John, of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John doesn't talk about communion. John doesn't seem to be interested in explaining communion to us as the other three gospels do. It seems to be right there, almost talking about communion. But John, as he relates Jesus' story, it never happens. There is no communion as we think about it. There is no sacrament as we think about it in John. It seems to be a commentary on communion, but it's not there. What John does instead is offers us foot washing. He has foot washing. Not the sharing of bread and wine. He has the Passover meal for that. He says there's foot washing, which breaks all kinds of um, rules because the foot washing starts with a woman washing a man's feet. And it goes through all that, but then Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, and the slaves are supposed to be doing all that kind of work, and something's just really messed up about it, we know from a cultural standpoint. So that's the transformation that Jesus is dealing with in John, and that John's related to us by telling the story. He's, he's transforming how we live, not just how we partake and participate in one particular meal. He's saying, yes, there's communion, but the communion that we want to do is we want to come together in a place that's been prepared for us, share together in these things, be it a meal, be it a foot washing, but share together, more importantly, in the ways of the heart, in the ways of life, because Jesus recognizes clear, clearly that something is troubled about our hearts. That our hearts are broken. Even before Jesus passes from this world, He knows His disciples are going to have trouble. He knows even in the midst of that going on that there's trouble. And I know, and you know, that those troubles have not gone away. We know each other well enough now that we all have our troubles. That our hearts are troubled. But the good news is, is that Jesus has prepared a place for us. And when we say that, we often think, yes, it's great. Even as, even as Jesus dealt with all the people in John, they would say things like, we, we talked about a few months, a few weeks ago with Lazarus, when the women said, well, yes, I know that in the resurrection, in the last days, that you will come. We think about it the same way. Well, I know that the place has been prepared for me when I die. But Jesus continues to say, you don't have to wait till then. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the truth. I am the way. I am right here. The place that I prepared for you is not just something that will happen in the future. It's something that has happened already. I am preparing 
I have prepared, and it is prepared for you right now. So I started to think about this, and John doesn't talk about communion in, in the way that we think about the sacrament of Holy Communion. And then I started to think about this place called the church, Ray Bank United Methodist Church, this sanctuary that has been prepared for us. And some of the common things, the most common thing that we see every Sunday besides the cross, and in a very real way, is this table. It's before us. And this table is, is most accurately called the communion table. It's got a lot of different names. We call it altar. We call it the place with the offering table. But it's, it's most accurately the communion table. And I can say that because right on the front of it, you probably read this every Sunday morning. Subconsciously or, or, or consciously, this do in remembrance of me. This do in remembrance of me, a reminder of the words of Jesus at the communion table. Do this in remembrance of me. When you, when you gather together, when you share in the meal, when you share in the body and blood of Christ. But now John's not talking about it. So at some level, John is talking about a communionless communion. The communion without the sacrament. Or the understanding that the sacrament is always the sacrament, no matter if you're sharing in the table or not sharing in the table. And that's what we do on Sunday morning. We come to worship. We come to be in communion, in community with one another. And sometimes we come with a particular element on the table, a bread and wine. And that's a good thing because it's good practice for us. To come to a table and share together the body and blood of Christ and be reminded what God did, to, did for us through Jesus Christ. But it's also a reminder when there's no bread and there's no wine on this table that we're still here for communion. That the sacrament is still a part of who we are. That Jesus has still prepared this place for us to be in community and communion with one another. Not just for a particular time, or a particular place, but for this place for all time. So when we come and worship, you can recognize that this place has been prepared for you. This place. This place of communion. So when I invite you to come forward on a Sunday morning when there's no particular elements up here, you're still coming forward in communion to receive in the body and blood of Christ by His grace. His grace is always present with us. Because throughout this John 14, 13, and 15, Jesus is reminding His disciples of what He has done, what He is doing, and what He will do. That He is present with us at all times. That the place He has prepared is right now for this place at this time. A couple of minutes before 12 o'clock on a Sunday morning. But this isn't the only place. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be present. Where God's people are gathered, the church is present. Where Jesus is present, that's the place that has been prepared for us. We can't only think that the place prepared for us is something that will happen at some point in the future that happens after we die. Jesus doesn't want us to think that way. He wants us to recognize the place is right now and is already, but not yet complete. And we can start here today. We can start here in this place that has been prepared for us. This place that is forever in our minds. And we can come forward this morning. And we can receive the communion. We can receive the communion of the Holy Spirit. It's always present for us. For John, it wasn't about... The, the development of an institution called the Sacrament of Holy Communion, it was about God's people being together in this life and in the life to come. Being together and being vulnerable and being willing to open themselves up, being hospitable, being in love and charity with each other, even when they didn't understand each other. Even when they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Because Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. And they didn't know where he was going. We don't always know where Jesus is going. We don't always understand what Jesus is talking about. We don't know the way. But Jesus promises us that even though we don't know, we don't understand, 
that he's going to stand in our midst and he's going to be there for us. Because as he said to Thomas, as he says to us, I am the way and I am the truth and I am life. Jesus has prepared us a place where that's true for all time. And right now that place is right here. A place prepared for you. Not for a few minutes, not for a few hours, but for all eternity. So in a few moments as we sing our, our hymn of invitation, I'm going to invite you, if you'd like to, to come forward, to, to receive the blessing of Jesus Christ, to receive the communion of the Holy Spirit, to recognize that you don't need bread and wine to do that. That that communion is always available to you. In this place, and in every place where Jesus is, and has prepared for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.